and welcome to our second session of Biari Talks. Today we re-invited Caroline Bertram from University Orthopedics. Very happy to have you back. Uh, we spoke at our first session about students in concussion and what it looks like to return to learn and return to school. And we definitely thought that um, mental health uh, needed to, we needed to shine a spotlight on mental health because that is one section of concussion that either gets overlooked or doesn't get looked at right away because we tend to look at those areas um, in, we look at those areas in the uh, physical and cognitive uh, realm. My name is Doreen Grasso, didn't even introduce myself. I am the Education and Program Coordinator um, at the Brain Injury Association of Rhode Island. And so we were having some of these informal talks to make sure that we can educate the public, um, especially here with you know parents, with students that um, get a concussion, um, to give you more information and hopefully get rid of some of the either misconceptions or answer some of your questions regarding concussion. So the Brain Injury Association of Rhode Island is dedicated to increasing the awareness of brain injury. And we wanna provide education to all agencies in all fashions um, to prevent brain injury and also to enhance the quality of life for those with brain injury. So these are students that with brain injury, we also have, you know, we run the gamut from students to, to seniors. Um, we have support services at the Brain Injury Association to help people um, connect with state agencies to give support. Um, Caroline and I both say that we're, we are not mental health professionals, but I work with people and try to educate people in the area of brain injury, which also mental health is, is a component, and she does as well. So we wanted to make sure that um, we spotlight this um, today. So um, when a concussion occurs, uh, in areas of youth, I think I'm just, I'm, uh, I'm freezing up here as well. Give me a second. Okay. Um, when, sorry, when concussions occur and youth uh, see practitioners, um, that's the A, that's the number one thing that we want to do. You know, we don't want to make sure that, you know, that people stay home. We want to make sure that youth uh, get the help that they need. It's in the Concussion Act of Rhode Island that especially with youth in sports, you have to come back, you have to come back and return to sport only with a doctor's approval. So we want to make sure that that, that happens. That's about 40% of the students who receive concussions, just as a statistic in the, the nationally and in the state. Um, we probably have about 15,000 concussions a year that are reported um, overall, not including youth. And when we did some, the Rhode Island Department of Health did a survey of school nurses with just a 50% response rate, they get over 700 concussions a year. So this is something that's real, it's not an outlier, it happens um, very often. We wanna make sure that people get the help that they need. So when we start looking at, um, I'm gonna talk to, uh, just mention some of the uh, resources that we've used. We, we use a lot from the CDC, so you can find a lot of um, information from the CDC concussion. We're looking at the 2022 National Healthcare Quality and Disparities Report and also in JAMA of the risks of mental health problems in uh, children and youth following concussions. We also, um, well, I will mention things about the, the REAP manual that we have, um, which is a concussion protocol that every school in Rhode Island has the availability. Uh, we've sent it to a lot of schools. We've done professional development with uh, teachers and counselors and school nurses. So that's something that you can ask your school um, if they've had professional development in, and they can always contact the Brain Injury Association. So that being said, um, we're gonna give you our take on, you know, what we see with mental health and uh, issues with mental health after concussion. I'm just gonna share um, a slide here. Here we go. This um, shows the symptom wheel. This is from Get Schooled on Concussions. It's also part of the TACT for Rhode Island, um, which is the teacher acute concussion tool, which every teacher has access to. If they don't have the information to access, they can contact the Brain Injury Association. So you can see here, you talk about the physical and the cognitive um, areas of concussion. Uh, sleep is another thing um, that I'm glad that it's its own separate category because if you don't get enough sleep, it can affect everything else. 
But that emotional issues right there about talking about um, what can happen in school, feeling emotional, nervous, sad, angry, irritable, um, and how to uh, allow the student to find ways to uh, kind of find respite in their day. Um, to have a have either whether it be in the nurse's office or a counselor's office, if they're feeling any of these anxiety, anxiousness um, that that is happening. So um, understand that mental fatigue also can bring emotional distress to students, um, especially students. You know, in high school, I see they are they have a concussion. They're still um, experiencing brain fog. And they say it takes twice as long to learn half as much, and that creates anxiety. We work on the teacher's end as well to say what can be actually cut out of the curriculum when during that month when students are adjusting to coming back. Most students within a month are, are okay um, cognitively, but you know that fatigue and how do they deal with it? Um, a lot of educators will say, "Okay, well, you'll make up all the work later." So that's probably not the best way to lower a student's anxiety, figuring that afterwards they're gonna to have to make up all this work. So there needs to be some adjustments and accommodations made for that student. Now there's a big difference between returning to school and returning to learn. We wanna make sure that once students have spent their time at home and they feel better to go back into um, school, that they wanna exacerbate any conditions that they already have, some, some symptoms that they have. So going back to school is important, um, socially, um, getting back together you know, with friends and moving around. Um, some, uh, Caroline's gonna talk about some light exercise and talk about um, that and how that affects your, your health after concussion. But returning to learn is different from returning to school. So they, we have to monitor students, monitor their symptoms um, from an educational level. And, and also you don't want to exacerbate those symptoms and really need to cut back and then gradually um, get back into full capacity um, uh, education wise. That's gonna be different for every student. We always say that when you see one concussion, you see one concussion. So there's, it's not cut and dry that this is gonna happen in one week, two weeks, three weeks. Um, and that's something that we really need to carefully monitor. So let me stop sharing my screen here. Here we go, and we're back. So now that we've talked about um, a little bit of what that, what that looks like, I'm going to pivot a little bit to Caroline to really see what you see at the clinical level when students come to you after a concussion. Sure, absolutely. Um, so just, I mean, just like you said, I am not a mental health professional, but really the main reason why that we decided to talk about this is because as we were talking through our last talk, I think a lot of topics came up kind of alluding to some of these concerns about mental health issues after concussion. And uh, when we were speaking afterwards, I was like, that can be a whole, <laughs> a whole nother talk. That can be a whole nother and now talk. now it is. That's perfect. Thank now you. it is. So here we are. Um, so, but that being said, even though I'm not a mental health professional, I'm still a healthcare professional. And you yourself working with kids um, with concussions and families with concussion, it's still a like huge part of practice. And um, for me specifically, I need to be able to recognize a lot of these things and then be able to refer people appropriately. Um, if I feel that it's necessary or if I see anything that kind of raises a flag um, to me. So um, just talking a little bit about why it's important to recognize these things. And then just the fact that I have Kind of combat that, I guess. Um, so really, it's a double-edged sword, right? So the kids already are having like a significant difficulty. Um, they're in a big adjustment period when they're in school. There's already um, a lot of high risk for the adolescent population for mental health concerns. Um, and then we add a injury on top of it, and specifically a head injury on top of it, and that just completely exacerbates things. So the double-edged sword really comes in that we know that for this population, physical activity is very protective against mental health concerns. So we know that um, it can help improve mental health. It can be protective against um, depression. But that being said, 
physical activity can also involve those contact sports, those collision sports that are associated with the increased risk of concussion. And then we see that following a concussion, we're at an increased risk for mental health disorder. So we don't necessarily want to take people out of collision or contact sports because that is extraordinarily important for mental health. However, we do need to kind of consider like, okay, well, if a head injury was to happen, what are some of the ramifications of that? So um, we definitely need to consider in that, that there needs to be some preventative measures for um, head injury in sports. So some things that have been thrown around as consideration are reducing contact participation in um, practices for younger ages or even in um, games for younger ages. So considering like flag football instead of um, tackle football below a certain age, um, not allowing body checking below a certain age, or potentially not even, or reducing the amount of contact time in a practice. And so that if they are playing a contact or collision sport, the contact time um, primarily for games or for competitions versus in practices. Um, and a lot of schools have done that, right? I'm sorry? A lot of schools have done that. Yes, well. definitely. A lot of schools have done that. A lot of states have mandated it. Um, so for sure, it's definitely not across the board, which is why I kind of bring it up, but it is definitely a large part of that. And that's made a huge impact. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other piece too, is that if a concussion is to happen, let's start introducing physical activity earlier on in the recovery, which is another thing that has been coming out recently. And we talked a lot about that before, right? So in, um, increasing physical activity versus just resting in a dark room for your recovery period has been shown to improve recovery, but it also puts you at decreased risk of um, potentially some of the mental health uh, concerns. Um, part of the reason for that is because when you start taking part in physical activity, especially for uh, these kids, when they start taking part in physical activity after their concussion, more likely it's going to be that they're taking part in like some activities that feel more familiar to them, as well as activities that make them feel like they're working towards a um, working back towards getting back to their sport. So um, in that light, we can look at it almost more like an orthopedic injury, right? That's um, a kid is when they've I don't know, twisted their ankle or had a severe knee injury and had to get surgery, all of their rehab getting back to that can be very motivating because a lot of it is very sport specific for them. So then taking that same concept and bringing into concussion rehabilitation and essentially incorporating them into things that um, could be similar to things they'd be doing in sport, but obviously in a brain safe space. Um, and then that can be very, again, very motivating for them and encouraging that, yeah, I will get back to where I used to be. Um, so that's kind of a good transition to some some statistics. Uh, you brought up JAMA or the Journal of the American Medical Association. So they have found that there is a 40% increase in mental health concerns after a concussion compared to mental health um, concerns following an orthopedic injury. So I just wanted to shed a little light on that statistic because that is a pretty big discrepancy. That's all like that's that's 40%. That's almost half. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a big discrepancy. So my speculation as to why there is the, definitely the potential for the direct association with the concussion being a brain injury. So there is changes in um, brain function following that injury. So that can definitely be playing a role in it. Um, but I also think that there is a big part of concussions being a less predictable injury. We can't predict the recovery time as well as we would for a general orthopedic injury. Um, and concussions are more likely to remove a person from their identity. Um, so really what I mean by that is like, it removes them from their identity in that it takes them not only away from their sport, but it also can take them away from school or work. Um, yes, orthopedic injuries can do that. However, orthopedic injuries have much more normalized adjustments to these things. Like it's nothing for a kid to have a hall pass to leave class a couple minutes early because they're on crutches or um, a pass to take the elevator in the hallways. Whereas like giving someone a note to pass early between classes because they have a brain injury and can't tolerate a busy hallway, that's not quite as normalized. So we just don't see it happen as often. Or if we do see it happen, 
that kids don't want to use those accommodations because no one can see their injury. No one's accepting that they have this injury. Um, and then the same thing can be said for social activities. So again, yes, we can do some adjustments to an extent for orthopedic injuries with some social activity. However, with a concussion, things aren't quite as normalized. So like, um, I don't know, a kid trying to go to their team's basketball game. Uh, I've seen teachers get upset because the kids are trying to participate and be at a basketball game, but then they couldn't tolerate doing their classroom work. Um, and I think that it's important that, no, well, we need to see a little bit of both. We need to see them integrated in like with their friends. Um, trying to normalize kids wearing earplugs if it's just too noisy and is more likely to give them a headache or sunglasses indoors if the lights are too bright, things like that, that um, again, they're things that would be able to help them tolerate their normal social activities with a concussion. It's just, they're not as normalized. So kids won't seek those adjustments or seek those accommodations. Um, so um, the other piece is, like I said, that's it's less predictable. It's less likely that we don't know how long these adjustments will have to go for. We can't say like, oh, for six to eight weeks while this injury heals, you just are going to need to be on crutches or you're going to need to um, leave class a couple minutes early. Like with a concussion, it's harder to judge how long these accommodations are going to need to go for. So I think both of those pieces kind of put a lot, um, a lot of pressure on the kids. So um, that then falls on us. That falls on us as um, healthcare workers, on educators, um, to help facilitate inclusion after a concussion. And a lot of this starts to overlap like what we were talking about in our last BRE talk. So um, advocating for school adjustments and then normalizing them. Normalizing that kids need to be in school, but not just for the learning material. They also need that for social socialization. You know, kids were very social creatures and especially in that adolescent uh, age group, they need to be creating those uh, relationships with their peers. So we would like, to, oh, go ahead. Were you no, going to ask gonna say, It's one of the things that I talk to teachers with all the time because they're wondering if kids are faking it and all that stuff. And I said, if anything I've seen, and you, you tell me if you've seen this too, I think more kids will fake it to be back with their friends to go do something. They don't want to stay home and like be on, you know, limited screen time or anything like that. They are very social creatures. Uh, and so they want to get back. Oftentimes, I mean, until you get a car, you know, school's where, where it's at, you know, that's, that's where your social life is. So mm -hmm. you get them in there. Um, and I say, we have to err to the side of caution. So yes, even though it's frustrating, it just, it's frustrating for the person you mentioned earlier. It's, we call it the invisible injury because people are like, you don't look like you had a brain injury. I'm like, well, I've had a brain injury. So what does it look like? I don't have scars on my face or something like that. So it's happening on the inside. That's why we really need to monitor symptoms and there needs to be a like a concussion management team between the counselor the school nurses and the teachers and that communication and parents um to make sure that um any differences are are, are seen so when you when you mention something about adolescence i think of you know that whole mixture of how white and gray matter progresses from you know you all of a sudden they go but my kid could do everything in elementary school and then they hit the wall and then they're like oh you know <laughs> that's a typical teenager though when you look at some of the things like fatigue and crankiness and moodiness and you're like doesn't that describe every teen and I'm like but so that can also you know add that could be concussion as well so one of the things that I mentioned to people it's always the parents, the teachers, the coaches, and friends, you'll know if this is something, an outlier for that particular person. And where another person that doesn't know this kid will go, well, that that describes every teen walking around in a middle school or a high school practically. So yep. people let me jump in on that, but I'm, I'm going no, to- No, no, you bring up a lot of- really science of it and look at the MRI, you know, they're not, they're problems, you know, adolescents, their problem solving goes down their judgment goes down and their need for excitement is up. So that's yes. why they have a lot of accidents at that age. So. Yeah. And uh, honestly, need for validation too. Like, and that just like mm -hmm. concussion aside, like a, a teen's need to, from my experience, at least a teen's need to hear like, you are doing a good job. Like what you're doing is okay. Or like, 
understanding like you're feeling sad today or you're feeling angry about this one thing and like that makes sense for these reasons and then helping with one of the big things that um I've read is that um the and it's like one of those things that it's like yeah it makes sense but like trying to figure out how to verbalize it that like in that developmental period that is where they're developing all of their coping strategies like their emotional coping strategies so if we take someone who's trying to learn how to cope with something emotionally and then we don't validate the way that they're feeling and don't like see the way that they're feeling and say like oh okay and then help them work through how to manage those feelings and how to deal with those feelings we're doing them a disservice Again, concussion aside. <laughs> right, right. I used to teach, I taught middle school for a long time and we we taught social competency skills. Mm-hmm. And I would say uh, half the adults I know don't know this. So you're you're getting a head start. And so yeah. how do you how do you do that for someone who is already having issues or mm-hmm. maybe their um their concussion have given those symptoms of poor emotional control or self-regulation or their social skills change or their anxiety um, changes, you know, there, it goes up. So, you know, how do you, how do you deal with that? And, and I also wanted to mention, you know, concussion, if there's um, uh, migraines, learning disabilities, anxiety, depression, that can exacerbate um, an already pre-existing condition as well. Yeah. So it's a lot, you know, it's, th- that's why we're here, I guess. So yeah, no. we'll make sure that people know about this because it's not just a, a moody teen, you know? Yeah, for yeah. sure. No, I, I will, stand on that soapbox like forever that um (laughs) it it is like especially a teenager especially a high schooler is not going to pretend to have a concussion like it's like the last thing that they are going to do a concussion is not an injury that you can go in with a cool cast and have all your friends sign it or like oh I'm on crutches so I get to have one of my buddies carry my books down the hall like a concussion is not that injury right now I would love to see it become that injury that like there's that much peer support around like oh man like you have a concussion I'm gonna go to the library and eat lunch with you and we're just gonna have like a nice quiet lunch just me and another peer like that's the stuff that I would love to see happen for these kids because that's where we're gonna take away that extra layer again that like there is there's no definitive science but there's definitely consideration that there is an underlying concussion pathology that causes some of the mental health concerns but we can't deny the fact that there is also this other piece of like social isolation that is a huge part of it and again like I said kids at this age they need validation and there is so little validation of these kids when they go to a teacher and they're like I have a concussion I need to go like I need to go to the nurse's office I'm getting a headache from this like this is just too much like there's so little validation like there's so much more like you need to be, you need to have your head up. Don't put your head down on the desk. Like you need to be paying attention versus Special like seating lights. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that's again, that's, I could go on and on about that. Okay. But <laughs> well, I guess spreading awareness will normalize it. So there are still yeah. a lot of teachers, even though I've given PD to um, school nurses, cause they know. And then I'm like, school nurses, can you give this information, this tact, you know, for, to the teachers it's not trickling through. And so if right. teachers don't know, they're like, oh, you know, he's, you know, he or she's just, you know, kind of exaggerating. I'm like, no, I mean, unless there's someone that that has actually had that experience with a concussion or their child with a concussion, then eyes are opened. Um, right. But yes, you know, the, the more spreading of awareness, the more that people will, will and it, it isn't an accommodation. It's mm-hmm. under, you know, it's under RTI. This is like tier one. And then some actually go into the tier two accommodations um, academically, but okay. Yeah. yeah. I am not saying, <laughs> I don't want anyone to get a concussion. I don't want anyone to get any brain injuries, but I did recently treat a teacher. And yeah. one of the things that this person said to me afterwards is that it completely changed their perspective on if they were to get a student with a concussion in their class, just that understanding of the brain fatigue, the inability, like sudden inability to do multiple things at once, even if it's just like thinking about something, this, the sudden like slowing of the ability to read or things like that. So yeah, it's just, I just, I don't want people to get head injuries. 
come across. Oh, like no, that. no, no, yeah. I, I had someone at the college level come in and in one of the, um, we were, I would always, I taught there to be a greater teachers. understanding. The best way. Yeah. And so I, I would, he said, I've had multiple concussions and I need some accommodations. And I'm like, wow, did you, did you find the right professor? Because I work yeah. for the Free Injury Association. So yeah. we, we just made those accommodations because, you know, taking a full load of college classes, I couldn't imagine how this, the student felt, you know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. So really what we can do is just adjust the way kids are doing things, you know, adjust their participation, not keep them out from um, being on the sideline with their team. If they have an injury, they can still grab waters for teammates. They can still participate in team huddles. They can help the coach at practice. They can grab equipment, things like that. Um, all of their symptoms allow, you know, maybe they have to wear a hat while they do these things, sunglasses, earplugs, something like that. Maybe they won't be able to do it for as long um, to start off, but at least they're still a part of their team. They're still a part of something. And we're still recognizing like, okay, this person has an injury. They can't be out on the field, but we're going to still support them as a team. Um, so I think that that's I, all of that. It'll just come with time and with greater understanding. Um, so yeah, so, I mean, I, that's kind of the big, the big part of everything. Um, I mean, I, I'll say that I've seen it plenty of times in my, my clinic, um, a large part of the concerns that I see are more that when after a concussion, we see this increase in sympathetic nervous system, uh, activation, it's a huge part just to kind of explain that real quick, we've got um, the autonomic nervous system, which are things that just kind of happen automatically in our body. And it's kind of our body's regulation system. So we've got two of them. We've got sympathetic, which is what we call our fight or flight. So this is our stress response. And then we've got our parasympathetic, which we say rest and digest. So that's kind of our calming. Um, and after a concussion, we definitely see a significant increase in that sympathetic nervous system. So our fight or flight response. That is directly, I think, a direct link between why we start to see some of this anxiety. Um, I actually, myself in clinic, have seen uh, several patients with increased anxiety. Um, I actually saw someone that I would put, um, again, not a mental health professional, but if they were to get, get tested, like some sort of panic disorder. He was starting to have panic attacks um, frequently um, and just not able to manage them. Um and again, it's just that significant increase in that fight or flight response. Um, and then that can directly be associated with the opposite, like the depression side, like the flattened affect withdrawal um, and things like that. So when you're constantly feeling that like anxiety piece, then we're going to also see you kind of go down that um, that depressive side. So I've definitely seen both things. Um, and then... I, Again, that's why we incorporate the best treatment for sympathetic nervous system dysfunction, best like non-medicational treatment is um, physical activity. So that's that's my bread and butter. <laughs> yeah. And then you <laughs> get something like, um, like yoga or meditation and because yeah. I teach yoga as well, that parasympathetic, parasympathetic system that just to give you that that calmness. Yes, um, you know? exactly. Yeah, no, go ahead. I was just going to say that um, deep breathing, as simple as that, so not even attending yoga. It's not a lot of my um, patients, especially, so thinking back to that person that I was saying was starting to have panic attacks, there were some sessions that we were just laying on in a recumbent position, so like we just lounge back, and our session was just going through deep breathing cycles and like mindfulness, meditation, like that sort of thing, just to kind of bring, just take an hour out of the day to bring that sympathetic nervous system way down. Mm -hmm. And then once we were feeling pretty good at that, and then um, this person was starting to be able to develop like self regulatory. So, like, if he started to notice in class, like rather than getting to a point that he was at full flown, recognizing, like, okay my heart rate's starting to elevate a little bit. This might've been like too much activity for me, but rather than completely removing myself, I'm going to sit here and try four deep breathing cycles first. And then that gradually increased the amount of time that this person was able to tolerate being in class. So um, doing that too. It's, it's really interesting how more and more schools are doing more mindfulness and meditation too. Cause you know, I think it was, it came especially after um, the isolation of COVID. Um, and so how do you use these techniques? Um, to, to kind of chill while you're in class. I always tell my students, um, I said, no one knows if you're breathing deeply. I mean, it's one of the things we 
eyes, you don't know that you're not like Ooh, in the corner, you know, like this, you know? <laughs> just, just breathe deep, even if it's test anxiety, you know, anything like that, you know? Yeah. Helpful. Yeah. The real subtle, subtle way that I always encourage it is breathing in through the nose for four seconds hold it for four seconds and then breathe slowly out for six seconds. And again, like, it's not like you're like, it's just like, it's just yeah. a nice, quiet, simple, deep breath in. It's like, no one, again, like you said, like no one has everyone to knows. know. <laughs> everyone has to breathe. <laughs> so, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and then, yeah, the, the depressive side of things, that's really where I start to consider a referral out. Um, I think the biggest thing is that I, I try to create a relationship with these kids. I, didn't know them before their injury. Rarely. Sometimes I've seen people multiple times, but I rarely knew them before their injury. So I don't know when I meet them day one, a lot of these kids have had their concussion like 24 hours prior to seeing me. So that's not a long time. So they're still feeling very like subdued, very like overstimulated. So already they're not their normal personality, essentially. So it's really over time that I start to try to see like, okay, are they starting to develop more of a personality? And am I seeing more of like a, a jubilant side to them versus just this like quiet reserved side. And when I don't start to see that, that's where I start to have the conversation, not only with them, but especially if they're a minor with their parent, like, okay, well, what are they like typically? Is there, are they typically are they typically this reserved? Um, and then if if it's kind of like, no, this is kind of like a new thing, that's where we kind of start to have a conversation. Like, have you considered talking to someone? Um, I think the beautiful thing is that it's so accessible now. Because like you said, after the isolation of COVID and like there's just been this wonderful boom of like talking about mental health. And so now um, there are so many, like the biggest answer I get from teens is I don't talk about my feelings. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's, and that's fine. But then the understanding that like, Hey, that's cool. But like, you could also take that weight off your shoulders in your own bedroom, snuggling with your own dog while you talk to someone online. Like you don't have to go anywhere. It's not like you have to go to a clinical appointment. Like there's such accessibility now for this that just trying to continue to have that conversation and as a healthcare practitioner just not being afraid to have that conversation absolutely Um, even if like you know if if it's a little bit of a flag for you some of the things that we've seen or i've seen you know with the the brain injury association are those outliers where parents are like i didn't know and then there's like a suicide or something i mean it's it's rare in the in how many kids get get um concussions but you know, you hear the stories of something that happened, then all of a sudden they felt withdrawn, the kids noticed it, everyone else noticed it, the friends, and then there's some tragedy. And that's, you know, we try to avoid it. um, But the more we talk about it, and the more that um, other adults pick up on this, you know, to trade, maybe talk with the parents or or the schools, um, that that could be um, an intervention, if it's ideation or, or, you know, um, that happens. Because that could be even something that has hit the emotional regulation center of the brain. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. Correct. Correct. So yeah, it's, it's an important conversation to have. It's a difficult conversation to have. Um, Even as a healthcare practitioner who's worked in both like risk management with that, as well as with this population. um, Yeah. It's a difficult to have, but you'll never regret having it. Exactly. I think that's an important thing to say. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so that's kind of the the bulk of the the conversation that I really thought was important to have. I don't know if you have any questions for me or anything else you want to add, but. Well, I think that our flow of conversation, we're definitely on the same page, even though that I hit it from an academic field and you're a physical field. It, it's, it's the whole team effort. Um, yeah. It's one of the things that I mentioned, you know, that on that whole, that I'm going to do the REIT manual again, but it talks about all the different teams communicating um, whether that be a doctor, um, and sometimes it's hard to go back to doctors, you know, you, you see doctors for a little while, you know, like, you know, we talk about traumatic brain injury, about 80% are concussions and the other more are mild and severe, which get taken care of, you know, a, in a different route in school with, um, uh, their special education department. But a lot of the, the students are just, you know, walk around afterwards. And then the more awareness that we spread among the, brain injury community and all the stakeholders that surround a child, you know, it takes a village to going an old phrase. It certainly takes a village. 
Um, and so I just wanted to see, I wanted to show a, a couple of things right here. If I could share my screen again. Um, that was the symptom wheel right here. Um, this was just kind of like the picture of the, the changing of the, um, the, the gray matter volume um, with students. But when you start looking at all these activities, you know, the physical, the cognitive, remove, reduce, get good sleep, um, check in um, on, on emotions and, and feelings, um, you know, it's, it's just really, really important. Did that show up on your screen right there? I didn't see it. I didn't okay. see it. That's okay. I'll just, I, it's okay. We, we kind of talked about it anyways, but yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is great. I certainly appreciate, you know, coming on again to, I, I agree, we, you know, we, we agreed after that, the last, the first one that, you know, mental health needed to be um, spotlighted in its own, in its own session, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so you can be found at University Orthopedics. You want to say a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I, I can be found at University Orthopedics. Um, I will see injuries as soon as 24 hours afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and honestly, for all of these kids and the support that they need, I want to see every concussion. I think that's the biggest thing that, mm -hmm. um, People, I, the biggest question that I get as a physical therapist is like, why does my kid need to have physical therapy after their concussion? Um, Cause there's so much there's, I mean, just listening to our last talk and then all of the stuff that we cover here, there's so much that this injury encompasses that mm -hmm. having as much support as possible to get a full recovery from it mm -hmm. just significantly improves their ability to um, not get a another head injury or b another just other physical injury when they do return to their sport um, following. So yeah, so I'm here at University Orthopedics. Um, they can come see me 24 hours after. And I mean, hopefully I don't have to see too many, but <laughs> Well, you know, I want to help as many as I can when they happen. <laughs> that, this is true. And then at the Brain Injury Association, we have a brain injury navigator. You know, I work with the education. So I work with the schools and the agencies in the state. And Colleen McCarthy is our brain injury uh, neuro resource navigator. And she helps um, match people with their needs. You know, sometimes it's parents calling us. Sometimes it's a, a spouse. But some people, sometimes it's just the person with the brain injury. And they're trying to navigate this with a brain injury on top of it. So um, she has a lot of expertise in the field and knows, okay, you want to go to this place, this place, I'll call for you. I'll fill out these forms. Um, so we're, we're here to help. I'll work with schools and facilitate that, that go between with the schools so they can always um, contact us. I'm just going to share that one part right there. Let me see. Here we go. So here's the, the Brain Injury Association of Rhode Island. We were at uh, 1017 Waterman. We just moved a couple of doors down to 1029 Waterman Avenue in East Providence. But you can contact us by calling 228-3319. You could visit our website, biari.org. It's also under resources there. Um, all the parents can get um, a copy of the REIT manual electronically. And it also has a link to our YouTube page that has a parent video with a Q&A with Dr. Karen McAvoy that talks about, so my child's had a concussion, where do I go from there? So Caroline, thank you so much for um, coming back again. I'm sure, you know, we'll find another topic down the line, but I certainly <laughs> appreciate the time and the conversation on the very important topic of uh, youth concussions and mental health. So thank you very Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Yep. <laughs>